Hello, welcome back to the channel. Uh, this time we're doing a, uh, exploring a mine or a mine dig, as opposed to a cave, and uh, it's a, it's a, it fo follows the uh, excavation of a, a 19th century lead mine at High Rake, uh, <coughs> which is close to Windmill in Derbyshire, and it, um, excavated by a team under John Barnett, Dr. John Barnett and a team from the Peak District Mines Historical Society uh, who do digs regularly and hit upon this one as being suitable for exploration and, to, and interpretation as to what was there and what could be found and, and so on. Um, it took them a long while to actually you know, get the whole site revealed, uh, but if you are uh, passing that area and want to have a look at it, there's some interpretation panels and there's quite a lot to see really. Um, if you want to try to get the atmosphere of what it was like to work in those, uh, you know, in the hilltops in Derbyshire. Perhaps one of the most exciting parts for me was actually making a descent of the, I think it's 700 foot deep uh, engine shaft, which uh, which was dug <coughs> um, on a on a little seat, <laughs> lowered by a winch, and uh, you can only go down so far. Um, because it's half full of water, but it's still pretty exciting. Um, the, the visit to the shaft was granted by the um, Peak District just for this one visit, and it's not normally open at all. There's not, no way you can get down as a rule, but we were privileged to, to have it open for us to explore and record. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoy it anyway. It's a bit different. And uh, as I say, I have to thank John Barnett and his team for allowing me to be there to film it as it was uncovered. By the way, if there's any, any of you who wish to sort of uh, know more about the films or perhaps any point in the films that you wish to ask me about, um, please feel free to do so. If you just put it in the comments section and uh, I'll get back to you. Thanks then. This patch of rough ground is being forced to give up its buried secrets to a group of hard-working and determined archaeological diggers. It lies beneath Hucklow Edge, close to the tiny hamlet of Windmill. High Rake Lead Mine is on a mineral vein, or rake, which extends through Windmill on the east to Tideslow Top in the west, where it becomes Tideslow Rake. Much of our mining heritage has been lost forever, but this narrow strip of protected land contains shafts and many other important features which, thanks to John Barnett and his team, are gradually being added to by discoveries at High Rake. These mining remains, some of which date from medieval times, are an integral part of our Peak District landscape and can reveal much about a past way of life. I asked John why they chose to excavate this particular site. Well, although there was very little to see here, we knew it had been a very important mine in the 19th century. Before we started, there was very little to see. Only this part of this crushing stone here and a big concrete cap over the main shaft. But um, we knew from old records that it had been a very big site with big engine houses and so on. So the Peak District Mine and uh, Conservation Team um, decided that we would do an excavation here. Uh, several reasons for that. One is to, to find out a lot more about the site and, and what was happening here in the 19th century. But also it's right next to a, to a main public footpath. So it enabled us to um, talk to people about mining, allow them to get enthusiastic, to eventually when we finish to consolidate all the walls we've found and put up interpretation for people to see in the future. 
This is where we started excavating and wait, what we have here is the site of a circular crusher where the, where designed to crush the ore. This is the crushing wheel. Now this would have been set upright just here and um, you see these notches, there's a series of them round, they were for wedges and it had an iron tyre and it ran on an iron bed which ran in a circle round, round um, here. When we first started digging this um, you can't see it's now, it's deteriorated. You could actually see the lines of rust off the edge of the, the iron um, track that it ran on. This stone was upright and it had a big wooden um, post through it from a central pivot there. The post came out here and was attached to a horse and the horse pulled the wheel round. This little bit of surviving, crush, of, um, surviving paving here is where they piled the ore and then they'd shovel it under the stone as it was going round and the stone of course crushed the ore. Right, we're on the other side of the engine shaft now and this is the second site we dug. There's not much to see, although we know exactly what was here. It's the site of a big um, timber gin engine and um, that was used for winding the stone out of the shaft when they were sinking it. And um, this central hole here is where there was a, a gritstone block. From that, a big vertical timber came up, up from a bearing to a big drum above our heads. The rope was on the drum and went off the drum and over headgear down into the shaft. Now, that again was pulled round by a horse. And when we first dug this, you can't see it now, it's become overgrown. You could just see a very, very shallow groove where the horse used to walk, where it had eroded a path round in a circle. Right, we're at the first of our ambitious excavation trenches now. What we're at is the site of an 1847 winding engine. It was a Cornish engine, two-storey beam arm engine. And what we knew before we started was that there were two big engine houses on this site and they'd both been demolished in the late 1920s by Henry Boot and the stone used to build council houses in Bradwell and possibly elsewhere. So we weren't sure before we started what we were going to find, if anything. And this site here was completely buried. There was no sign of it whatsoever. We knew exactly where it was from old Ordnance Survey maps from 1880, but that's all we knew. We didn't know whether Henry Boot had taken the stone out completely, just leaving robber trenches for the walls. As it turns out, we've got the bases of the walls, which was very nice to find. But it didn't half take some getting here, because there was a mound of spoil above this engine house here that was something like three metres high. And after digging small trenches by hand, just to find the beginnings of walls, we realised that we'd have to um, get excavation equipment in here and we ended up um, with uh, JCB taking most of the spoil off. Over here you, you can see the footings of this engine house. I'm on one of the walls now and it runs up, up there and you can trace it all the way around. The, the engine and the beam was completely inside this building unlike some Cornish engine houses. The building I've just stepped into now is part of the boiler house. The engine house is there and of course with a, with a steam engine you need a boiler. The bit of it I'm in now, this long thin building, is where they used to stoke the boiler and when we dug out the demolition rubble we found all the coal dust on the floor from, from where the piles of coal used to be. The boiler was just here, supported on those two plinths. Um, a long Cornish boiler, just a single big boiler, in the central area of the building. And then um, further down, we'll wander down there and have a look at what's at the other end. From the back of the boiler there were flues that take you through to a chimney. But they ran through the centre of this bit of the building and it's paved. And what we think this is, is a small miner's dry where the miners could hang their clothes overnight to be drying out next to the, the hot pipe work.
I'm standing now in the base of the chimney. This is the chimney you can see in the old photograph we've got of the site taken in the early 1900s. Before we started digging here, there was this mound of material um, from the 20th century reworking of the site was way up above my head here. And we knew from the old Ordnance Survey map that there was a chimney somewhere around here and we dug in several places before we actually found it. Right, this is the, st the site of the, of the biggest set of buildings on the site. We've just started, but only just started digging out the, the foundations of the Sims pumping engine. This was um, put on the mine between 1842 and 1844 and was a massive Cornish pumping engine of, of unusual design. It was, it was built um, to a patent from, um, from a mine engineer called Sims who, who designed this wonderfully complicated engine which had one cylinder above the other which is unusual. Um, not that many of them were built because although it was a, a very good design it proved to be over complicated and they kept breaking down. When we first got here on this part of the site we thought we would just end up with a similar situation to the winding house with just the bottom few courses of the walls from after it was demolished. What we found much to our excitement is that when they built Sims engines, they had two choices. They could either build a very high engine house or, could, or they could partially sink it into the ground. And we found it sunk into the ground. And that we probably actually got something like a quarter or a third of the engine house still here and still buried. As you can see, when you look down the condenser pit here, you've got the, the bob wall of the engine house going way, way down into the ground and um, we've still not got to the bottom of this pit yet but let's wander around and look at it in some detail. We're in what's called the condenser pit and when the steam came out of the engine it was brought in pipes into a tank of water which was in the bottom of here to condense the steam. Right, we've only just started clearing out the engine house. This, as you can see the walls are just beginning to appear We've left this till last because, because we're using uh, diggers. Um, we're having to retreat out of the site and if we'd have dug this first, we wouldn't have been able to clear the boiler house, which is what we shall look at next. It's over here. Right, we've walked now from, from the engine house itself into the middle of the boiler house. In this boiler house, which is, which is much, much bigger than the one for the winding engine, there was one huge Cornish boiler and it needed to be huge because you need a, an awful lot more power for a pumping engine than you do a winding engine. Now here we have, have the flue, you can see there's quite a lot of it left. Much to our surprise, you know, th there's a good metre and a half's worth still here because of course the boiler house was sunken so it starts at a lower level and partly was set underground. Very, very much bigger chimney than, than the one for the winding engine and we, we know from the documents that this chimney was 64 feet high. A, a, a really great shame that such a feature has, has got demolished in the 20th century because um, once upon a time before that demolition this site actually rivaled Magpie Mine for the buildings here and the scale of them. Right, what we'll do now is go and look at one of the surprises of the excavation. This wonderful cobble floor was, was a total surprise to us. Before we started digging, nobody knew this was here. What we now know it is, is it's the outdoor coal yard for, for the large quantities of coal you'd need to keep this pumping engine going. Um, it's intact except for this trench cut through here. The site of the pipe that came from the reservoir there through to the boiler house. And they actually dug through the cobble floor in, in order to remove this pipe and uh, we know this was a coal yard because if you look carefully down here in amongst all the cobbles there's lots of small pieces of coal that um, when they've kept the heaps of coal here they, the little bits have gone down into all the cracks. 
We've had a, a brief look round what we've done so far at surface, but this is what it's all about. This shaft is where they hoped to get all the rich ore from, but never did. But of course, they were pumping water out of it to mine, and the bottom half of it, roughly now, is full of water. If we drop this in, we can, we can hear it splash right down at the bottom. Congratulations, all of you. You've finished our race. We've been here eight years, and this is the last working day. Yeah, awesome. We've started yeah. silence, man. The site looks very different now from when we first saw it several years ago, and this impressive aerial photograph gives a very clear indication of the true scale and context of the various structures that have been revealed during excavations. It's now 2007 and John's showing me the latest discoveries such as this area which posed as many questions as answers when it was first unearthed. Here the rock as mined would be crushed and washed and the separated lead ore or galena sent off to be smelted. Right Dave, this is the last bit of excavation that we've to do. We're in the middle of it at the moment. Ever so interesting, we're on the old um, dressing floors where they process the ore and paving running off. We've still more to do, but it's the last bit of excavation on the site. Since you were last here, we've done some major excavations over on the pumping house, so let's go and look at that. The team, who only meet once a month, remember, have moved mountains to give us a very clear idea of the layout of a large-scale 19th century Derbyshire lead mine. Significant finds have been made elsewhere on the site, but the main feature remains the nationally important Sunken Sims Pumping Engine House, and we'll get a privileged view as John proudly shows us around. Right, here we are in the bottom of the condenser pit. As you can see now we've emptied it because it's oh, over 8 metres deep now. Um, we found quite a lot of interesting things. These plinths here are supported the tank of water that the condenser was in. When the steam came out of the cylinder, came into the condenser, that condensed the steam to water, creating a vacuum in the cylinder which gave it its great power. All this engine, of course, was steam, but there was lots of water and bits of it used to leak and drip. Here you can see where the beams were, look here, 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 that supported this big tank. These buildings are solid like the people who built and worked in them, 
and John would have had to clamber through a maze of hot pipes and escaping steam to make this short journey 170 years ago. Right, we're in the bottom of the uh, main pumping engine house now. Very important building. We've got about a third of it and two thirds above are missing. It was one of the largest Sims engine houses in Britain, in the world in fact. So very important remains. Uh, we're amazed to find so much of it still here. And we've got entrances look coming in from the boiler house where pipes came. This wonderful arch which led through to the condenser pit and all the pipe work went through to the condenser pit. Then you've got slots for more floors. And then if we come over this way, there's more things still. Right, we've come over this side, and you see this ledge here? That's where there was a floor that supported the bottom of the main cylinder. There was, there was a space under here for, for maintenance and so on. But that wall we've had to rebuild. When they took the cylinder out, they ripped the floor out and it caused collapses. So you've got this wonderful cylinder, which went from about there to there, going right the way up. After they put it in, they must have panicked and thought, is this floor strong enough? Because you see this slot here and there's no one there. That's where they put timber beams to support the floor from underneath because they were worried about the thing vibrating. When they first dug this, you could still see the grain of the wood impressed into the mortar there in the sides of the pit. This is an impressive place. But our next port of call is even more impressive for its sheer isolation and awe-inspiring workmanship. We're returning to the shaft for a filmed descent into its gloomy depths and where you'll witness some rarely seen details of its construction. For several generations now we've witnessed the ever-quickening destruction of our once abundant mine-related buildings. Magpie Mine is a rare exception, and one the old miner may even recognise today. But complete buildings are rare, with few reminders of this once great industry that gave a living to men up and down the county. I rake alone employed up to 40 for around 20 years, with skills such as shaft sinking, walling and ore dressing. It's possible that High Rake only survived because it became a council rubbish tip and few realised what lay hidden beneath. As a bonus, the team also discovered a wealth of archived documents relating specifically to this mine. But the structure on which success or failure of the mine depended lies virtually intact, but hidden below ground, and we couldn't possibly leave the site without having a look beneath the concrete cap to record the shaft's hidden secrets. Well, it's beautifully lying down, down below. Beautifully lined, oval, uh, with the ashen stone, all dressed. It's absolutely fantastic. This enthusiastic description of the shaft was based upon what could be seen when a lighted newspaper had been dropped down many years earlier. But the team had a strong desire to see and record for themselves what lay beneath the heavy concrete plug. The necessary permissions had been obtained, and the team gathered round to decide the best approach. All, well, perhaps not quite all, eager to descend and examine this magnificent structure. First to descend, Terry Worthington, a nervous bant has given way to the serious business of inspection to ensure that work in the shaft can be carried out in relative safety. A telephone and cable link allow Terry to talk to the winch operator to control his descent. The camera records the blocked opening for the counterbalance bob, there to help lift the 100 tonne pump rods. OK John, down! The gritstone blocks of the collar were put in place in 1842, the same time as the pumping engine house was built. They sit on top of the extensive earlier limestone jinjing. The mishmash of materials represents several generations of capping. Best not to look too closely. Bits of rotting timber protrude from the ginging which would have been part of the bratticing that divided the shaft into sections. 
allowing miners to climb a ladderway separate from the pumping and hauling activities. At a depth of 20 metres, bedrock's reached, and a limestone bridge supports a section of the base of the Jinjing. Christ, I thought the water was lower than that. <laughs> well, we measured it, John. It's 98 and a half metres nearly. Yeah. You know, it's 300 foot. Yeah. It does look it, does it, perspective wise? No, it's it such a big bugger. Now he's past the Gingin now, isn't he? He's in solid. Yeah. Much pickwork and carefully carved notches for timber platforms show the care the old miners took over their work. The Jinjing here is at a point where the first of two wayboards is met. A wayboard's a layer of crumbly volcanic clay and the gap must be ginged to prevent collapse. Larger notches are at the level of the second wayboard into which a much later trial level was driven by William Wyatt, the mine agent. He intercepted the old man's workings on the main vein, but only small amounts of ore were recovered. At a depth of 70 metres, or 230 feet, large slots appear which supported a timber platform for one of the pump cisterns. The cisterns were reservoirs for water pump from below, in which an upper set of pipes were immersed to raise the water ever higher and eventually to surface. The bedrock sides of the shaft give way to gritstone ashlar at this point and limestone to toadstone, a geological event that so affected the fortunes of the miners at High Rake. Earlier attempts to bridge the toadstone had met with little success. We're now at the point where William Wyatt, for the High Rake Mining Company, widened and deepened the shaft to a final depth of 220 metres in an attempt to break through. Unfortunately, further work on deepening the shaft had to be suspended for over a year when it was found that the upper part of the toadstone was crumbling and they were forced to begin work constructing a retaining wall of this high-quality gritstone ashlar. It's extraordinary workmanship and we know from records that the mason was William Morton, the man who also built the pumping engine house. It's now fingers crossed that the phone works. That pile of debris on top of rotting staging is unlikely to provide much of a refuge if I don't stop. Stop! I'm 330 feet down now, and the ancient wooden ladder's protruding from nearly 400 feet of water. Not a place to hang around. Seeing the tiny white dot above gives a true sense of depth, and on the way up there's time to reflect on the daily toil and the climb the miners faced at the end of a tiring day. No winch for them. The High Rake Mining Company wound up in 1852, having lost over £12,000, millions at today's values, and they never did achieve their aim of reaching ore beneath the toadstone. But they left behind this seldom seen but magnificent structure, and as daylight nears, one can only admire the symmetry and scale of this extraordinary testament to hard graft and optimism. Which way? Yeah.